Dear uh, colleagues, uh, Webex attendees of the first uh, Discovery Park uh, distinguished lecture on, on the new medium of uh, Web Webex. On behalf of Executive Vice President Teresa Meyer and the directors of the Discovery Park centers and institutes, it is my distinct honor to invite Purdue University President Mitch Daniels to host this Lilly Foundation Endowed Discovery Park Distinguished Lecture and introduce our speaker, Professor K. R. Srinivasan. Welcome everyone to Discovery Park Lecture Series, but to a genuine first, our first WebEx Discovery Park Lecture. Any first of its kind event ought to be a special one, and this one is by virtue of the remarkable speaker who has agreed to share the occasion with us. Dr. Kanapale Srinivasan is one of the most esteemed names anywhere in the world of physics. And he's taught at Yale, at NYU, at Cambridge, and, and uh, been a visiting scholar at, it seems, almost every hall of great science uh, anywhere in our world. He is today going to talk to us and illuminate us about another great scientist, Abu Salam, who, uh, whose own uh, career resembles Dr. Srinivasan's in so many ways. Our only regret is that the circumstances prevented us from meeting him and greeting him in person, but I know that the, uh, the remarks to come will be just as informative and illuminating as uh, uh, we might have expected under any other circumstances. With great pleasure, and it's an enormous privilege for all of us at Purdue to welcome Dr. Katapali Srinivasan. Shall I go ahead? Yes, please, Srini. Okay, all right. So I want to start by thanking uh, Professor Daniels, uh, President Daniels, for his uh, very kind introductory remarks. I know that he is very busy, and so are everybody else. Uh, the executive vice president Teresa Meyer and uh, you, uh, Jay, uh, for uh, inviting me to speak. And I also want to thank Hasti for uh, all the technical help he provided uh, to me in the last uh, couple of days, and the Lilly Foundation that. Uh, uh, enables this lecture. Uh, you're all very busy and uh, your routines have been hijacked by this uh, strange virus. And therefore, I doubly appreciate your being here and giving me this opportunity and your presence. Um, there is no doubt that as we return to normalcy um, or what we think is going to be normal, um, all of us have to use um, our commitment to our work and to our institution and put aside the science of uh, me first uh, philosophy. Therefore, it is good to remind ourselves the, about the lives of uh, idealists in some sense. And one of them I want to speak about is Abdus Salam, who was extremely successful on many planes. Yet his life were dismally uh, collided with the obduracy of his country and religion with which he could not cope. And the endless fights ensued and uh, it provided him great strife and anguish until his death. And in fact, uh, you might say even after his death, as you will see. I would like to describe uh, briefly his accomplishments, his um, blemishes as well, because in them we might find a, a lesson of um, different sorts for different people, especially for the younger members of the audience. And so let me um, say that uh, I will say a little bit about Salam's science, but more about his life. Um, if it were a specialized audience, I would speak a little bit more about his science than uh, now. 
So I would like to share my screen somehow and go here and share content and okay so uh, you can see the screen right okay i assume assume yes we can see the yes, screen we can see the screen and thank you for using the great discovery park sign Srini. of course <laughs> you sent you sent it to me and i thought it was really very nice so i thought i would use it um so um let me uh, then uh, go here and show you Salam when he was 14 years old with a turban and a long coat and spectacles and things like that. And this was when he was 53. Again, the turban, long coat and spectacles with a beard, of course. Um, you might think that it did not change uh, through his life, but that's not really true. That's how Salam looked most of his life. And in fact, how he looked had uh, something to do with the way uh, his attitude towards many things changed. And I will uh, describe some of that as we go along. So uh, it's useful to think of Salam's life in three strands, which are intertwined uh, together. And uh, in each of them, he was successful in varying degrees. And one of them, his own science, which was the uh, physics of high energy particles and he reached um, zenith in this he shared the nobel prize in 1979 and many many other honors came by and the second uh, strand is that he was a passionate spokesperson for science in uh, developing countries uh, and now they are called developing countries at that time they used to be called the third world and he was enormously successful in this endeavor with uh, one notable failure, at least one, which I will describe. And it is this combination of uh, science and uh, the powerful voice that he lent to uh, science and scientists in developing countries that made Salam extremely special, uh, which he really was. The third strand that uh, weaves in and out of his life is Pakistan and Islam. Now, this connection carried him very high, uh, as I will describe, but it turned against him to, great, to his great distress. And in fact, uh, it was a source of uh, enormous uh, unhappiness in his uh, life towards the end, especially. Now, let me talk about uh, Salam's career and his scientific stand. That is the first one. That's really where uh, Salam was educated, a small uh, village in uh, uh, near Lahore, which is now in Pakistan, then in British India. And uh, Salam, when he went to the entrance exam, uh, he was 14 years old. He got uh, extremely high marks in his exam. And in fact, that record has never been broken since. And uh, you see here the newspaper account of his, if you can read Urdu, you will read it. But basically what it is saying is, Abdul Salam breaks the record for matriculation in Punjab University board exam. So he started off with a very brilliant uh, career. And then he went to this uh, university in Lahore, um, government college, and then uh, what, what happened was, at that time, um, his father wanted him to take an ICS exam, which is uh, Indian civil service exam. But there was a requirement that any person who takes that exam has to have a degree from England at that time. And so he was looking for an opportunity. And at that time, St. John's College in Cambridge, UK, would occasionally admit a student or two from India. The person they had chosen in 1945, this is the year Salam graduated from the government college in Lahore. He did not accept the scholarship because the Second World War was still unfinished. So Salam got it instead. So he promptly enrolled as an undergraduate at St. John's. And of course, you know how beautiful St. John's looks like. And that's how Salam looked like at that time. 
and uh, the scholarship discontinued pretty soon after. So Salam would later say that it was divine for him, so to speak. So that was how his career started. And he went to uh, St. John's and passed the mathematics tripos with honors just in two years. But during that time, he had fallen under the spell of uh, Dirac, Paul Dirac, with whom he was, he, of whom he was very fond through his entire life. And also Fred Hoyle, uh, both of whom you might know for other reasons. And so he thought he had one year left. Why not uh, do tripos in physics as well? And he graduated with honors in it as well. So very few in the history of Cambridge tripos have accomplished this field of um, tripos in, uh, in physics and math with high honors. So by the time it was 1949, and the country he had left, which was British India at the time, had now bifurcated into two parts, India and Pakistan, while he was in, in Cambridge. So his village geographically became part of Pakistan, and he himself was a Muslim, so he naturally chose to be a Pakistani citizen. He returned to Lahore in 1949, got married, convinced the Pakistani government to give him a fellowship for further work at Cambridge and returned to St. John's. Then he started his work, uh, research work, and he discovered a very important way to handle infinities of the Maison theory. And here is the first paper he wrote in Reviews of Modern Physics with his advisor, Paul Matthews. I will maybe say a little bit about it later on. Um, if you uh, remember, mesons are just a family of unstable subatomic, subatomic particles that are held together by strong forces, about which I will say a little bit as well. And um, um, now Salam got uh, the Smith Prize uh, for the outstanding pre-doctoral contribution to physics in 1951 which made him immediately famous in Cambridge. And Cambridge rules did not allow students to graduate with a PhD in two years. So he still had a year. And went to the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton for some months, from where he returned to the government college in Lahore, the department of mathematics. He was only 25 years old. Then he got his PhD a little bit after, a few months later. This triumphant return to Lahore didn't last very long. It didn't last very long because he was completely isolated as a physicist. And there was no tradition of doing postgraduate work or research there. So no up-to-date scientific literature and hardly any other scientists to discuss things with. The principal of the college told him to forget about research and assigned him to be a soccer coach in which Salam had no interest whatsoever and no experience. Another official told him that scientists are like cooks, good for making things to order but cannot be allowed to run things. So that was the message he got. So he was very desperate for scientific contacts. And he took two unauthorized trips to India, uh, TIFR, Tata Institute for Fundamental Research. And of course, um, did not succeed uh, in connecting very well. And he was officially chastised for making these trips to India. So depressed as a result of all these events, he returned to St. John's in 1954, two years later, as a fellow of St. John's, and a lecturer in mathematics. Now, in contrast to Lahore, Salam's career just bloomed in England. He was chosen a professor of mathematics in Imperial College, London, just at 31. And at 33, he was elected to the Royal Society. And the Imperial College essentially created a new position for him as professor of theoretical physics in 1960 and which is a position he held until the very end of his life. 
this is the theoretical physics group that he developed at uh, at Imperial College with him sitting somewhere in the middle you can see uh, you can recognize him from the photos I showed earlier it was a very uh, thriving group and in fact a number of very good people came out of this group and of course uh, later on in 1979 now fast forwarding a bit he shared the Nobel Prize with uh, Sheldon Glashoff and uh, Steven Weinberg here is the picture of him receiving the Nobel Prize decked in Punjabi dress with these curly shoes and everything and in fact his uh, cast was so um, amusing to the people who were there that he created a bit of stir in the Nobel Prize ceremony because every pair of eyes was on him and not on his co-winners who uh, tolerated all this with good humor and amusement as they were to say later and furthermore he brought his two wives to the event his Pakistani wife whom he had married in 1949 and with whom he had four children, all living in London, and his English wife, a distinguished Oxford professor, now no longer alive, whom he had met in 1962 and to whom he got married in 1968. Um, and they were living in Oxford. And as a Muslim, he felt that it was uh, perfectly acceptable to do this. And he managed his family life with the great uh, dexterity. And so the entourage that he took for the Nobel ceremony was pretty big, about 20 in number, which is pretty unheard of. During the life, Salam received many awards, medals, and academy memberships, and honorary doctorates, and things like that from all over the world. I just want to mention one before going on. In 1984, he was made the honorary Knight Commander of the British Empire, or KBE, equivalent to knighthood the first uh, Asian to be so honored. Asians were honored, but they were um, before him, but they were all, all in England, uh, British citizens, but he was still a Pakistani citizen. So why was Salam so well regarded? Part of it is his science. And I will uh, say a little bit about it now. He made many important contributions to his area. A good moment to describe only his Nobel work at uh, some high level, not in any great detail. Salam was always concerned with symmetries and unification of forces and seemed to have thought his being a Muslim gave him um, an advantage. I actually want to play a, an audio of his voice. I would never have started to work on this subject if I, if I, if I was not a Muslim, if I had not believed in Tawheed. If you are a particle physicist, you would like to have just one fundamental force and not four. That's the real unity between the forces. If you are a Muslim particle physicist, of course, you believe in this very, very strongly because unity is an idea which is very attractive to you culturally. But uh, if you are not a Muslim uh, fundamental for particle physicist, then uh, you may or may not believe this. This is the reason why we have scored over others in that sense. See how much he valued uh, his being a Muslim. So let me explain a little bit about these uh, forces and their unification. Um, on this slide, you can, you can see there is the Big Bang here, and we are progressing to the right in time. And this is a highly compressed time, of course, and a very nonlinear. And the red uh, line, vertical line here, let's say is the present day. And in particle phys physics, there are four forces. One is the gravitational force. The other is the strong force, the electromagnetic force, and the weak force. Now, the holy grail of research particle physics uh, is to unify them. And the gravitational force, the bottom one, um, is something that everybody knows about. And it is a weak force, even though we experience gravity, it's because the, uh, the object that is attracting us is the Earth, which is a massive object. But my laptop, for instance, does not have any attractive force uh, towards me or very little of it, and me, uh, likewise, for the laptop. 
And so I will leave uh, that without any further comment, except that Newton unified the terrestrial and celestial gravitation by realizing that the gravity that acts on the Earth is the same gravity that acts in the celestial objects of the heavens above. That was an extraordinary leap of um, a faith in uh, the whole in the whole thing and it made the enormous number of things possible then let's go to the electromagnetic force the uh, third from the bottom in the days of ampere and faraday as you remember electricity and magnetism were regarded as two separate forces it was the genius of maxwell that unified them into a single force called electromagnetism it's a force exerted between uh, charged objects with like charges repelling and um, unlike charges attracting, something that we have all seen in action. So I will not say anything about that either. The next in line is the so-called strong force that is between electromagnetic and gravitation. And this is the force that holds a nucleus of atoms and, uh, together. Nucleus, as you uh, all know, consists of neutrons and protons. And protons are positively charged particles. And so the question one might ask is, why are they held so close together without uh, repulsion? And the answer is that there is a strong force that is keeping them together. Now, let's go to the weak force, the one at the very top, which is the subtlest of them all, but an important one. It's a force that changes one element to another by converting a proton into a neutron and vice versa. It acts only when the, particle, when the interactions are very close, that is within, let's say, about 0.1% of the radius of the proton, something like that. When the energy levels are very high, or alternatively, if we get closer to the uh, Big Bang, say within one second of it, the electromagnetic and weak forces become unified. This was the combined work of Glashoff, Weinberg, and Salam, which showed how the unification occurs into a single force called the electroweak force. You can see weak force and electromagnetic force coming together at this point in this slide called the electro electroweak force here. And this is the term that Salam created, uh, besides, of course, doing the theory for it. The mathematics of electromagnetic interactions and weak interactions have been known to be similar for some time. It's not that he invented the concept. Uh, for example, their Feynman diagrams look alike and things of that sort. But uh, to explain this a little bit, every force, as you know, is mediated by a particle. In electromagnetic forces, the particle is a proton, which has um, a, a photon, which has no mass. In weak interactions, which take place when a neutrino comes, let's say, very close to the proton, as I said, within 0.1% or so of the radius, through a particle known as the W particle or a Z boson, an up quark can change into a down quark and can make a proton into a neutron. Here I have described it a little bit, but here is the tritium atom to the left, and it has two protons and one, one proton and two neutrons, and an electron going around in the orbit. And if you look at a, a neutron, it has, it has two down quarks and one up quark, and if it gets too close to a neutrino, then a W particle can change one down quark into an up quark, and that's what you see on the uh, in this diagram here, here, and that actually means that what were two neutrons have become now uh, two protons, and uh, what were two neutrons has become one neutron, and this is the structure of helium three. So by virtue of this weak interaction, somehow one material has changed into another material. And this is very important, for example, in uh, fusion and things of that sort. So the proton, um, by, conver by converting a neutron into a proton, we just made it possible for one uh, a tritium atom to become a helium-3 atom. And so even though the force is very weak, and that's why it is called the weak force, it has enormous consequences in nature. 
and the electroweak unification, which is the unification of this weak force with the electromagnetic force, was a major step in understanding uh, the nature of forces, and it forms an important part of the so-called standard model of uh, particle physics, which I will uh, not describe here. In fact, if you go back to the previous slide, you can imagine as this slide imagines that if you go closer to the Big Bang, that is to higher and higher energy levels, there is a point at which the strong force will unite with the electroweak force. And this is one of the problems on which Slum worked uh, very heavily all his life and uh, to the development of the so-called uh, grand unification theory, also called GUT. GUT, but it is not uh, well established at the present. Of course, ultimately, if you go to really high energy levels, the whole idea is that all the forces will be united, and this is the holy grail of uh, particle physics. As you know, quantum gravity and all uh, various versions of string theory are working towards that end, and Salam was also involved in that kind of work in supersymmetry theory, and in applications of uh, Higgs mechanism for the electromagnetic, electroweak uh, symmetry breaking and things like that. So that's about his science and it obviously you can see that it plays a very important role in how we understand the nature of forces in the universe. And um, so he laid a fundamental uh, stone, a, f a founding stone for the, for the um, present understanding of the uh, particle physics and at high energies. So uh, that's about all I want to say unless until the very end about his science. But let me now go to the second strand. And the second strand uh, of his life has the powerful voice in support of science and scientists in uh, developing countries. And how did this uh, come about? Let's return to 1950, late 50s and early 60s. And Salam was still in mid 30s. As he settled down in Imperial College uh, and began to make a name for himself, the idea began to germinate in his head that one needs to create a high level center to battle the isolation of scientists in the third world which he had experienced himself. And this is what he said at the time the notion of a center that should cater particularly to the needs of physicists from developing countries had lived with me from 1954 when I was forced to leave my own country because I realized that if I stayed there much longer, I would have to leave physics through sheer intellectual isolation. He went on to say that if somebody had said to me at the time, stay in Lahore, but we will allow you to travel for three months every year to go to Cambridge or to other centers of science, renew your science and return, I would have grabbed that opportunity. At least that's what he said. And he also understood that science cannot flourish in intellectual desert. He pointed out quite often, if Einstein had been born in Burkina Faso, he would never have become what he was. So Salam's vision was to create a science center to combat the scientific isolation. And uh, he went about creating a, a high level international center loosely connected to the United Nations, providing uh, essentially scientists from developing countries the opportunities that he himself had aspired for in the second paragraph. Uh, here is the picture of the center that as it exists now, and it was founded in 1964 and Salam directed it for almost 30 years. Physical disability did not allow him to carry on any further. He never thought there was anybody else capable of succeeding him. Many physicists, mathematicians, and applied scientists in the developing world regard ICTP, International Center for Theoretical Physics, as the most influential center and have modeled their own centers of excellence after it. So I will um, uh, tell you a little bit about how the center came into existence when I go to the next strand. But let me say a few words about the center itself as it exists now. It's jointly run by 
UNESCO and the International Atomic Energy Agency, of which you've heard uh, many, many times, I'm sure. And the bottom uh, is, the, is the symbol of uh, Italian government. Now, by some international agreement, Italy agreed to provide visas to any scientist that the center deemed fit to invite. The center is concerned with scientists who remain in their own countries primarily, but come to the center for three months each year, let's say, to do research and to learn. The visitors meet other people uh, working in the same subject, learn new ideas and return to their countries for most of the time charged with an enormous zeal to do science. And it also provides a kind of network supporting each other, um, so there is no sense of isolation. In my time as the director of this center for seven years, the center had four scientific sections, one in high energy, one in math, other on condensed matter physics, and one on earth sciences, and applied physics, actually five. And about 6,000 visitors would come to the center every year. Some would stay there for a few days, some would stay there for a few weeks, some would stay there for a year or half a year, but nobody would live there permanently except for the small number of permanent staff who act as the, acted as the anchor for the scientific activities that took place uh, in the center. Um, I'm happy to say that uh, during the time I was there, we raised the number of women participants to about one third, which was about half of it when I went there. Uh, it was not half exactly, but I think it got very far along the way. Now, pretty much every scientist, scientist from developing countries has visited this center at one time or another. And the scientific sections always acted as the anchor, as I said, to the visitors. Now the center is in Trieste, as you can see, it's very beautiful and a lot of visitors would like to come there. It has a great history and you may, some of you may recognize this gentleman, James Joyce, who spent a good part of his uh, life there and uh, during the time he was most productive. Besides that, during the Cold War days, for instance, the center brought together physicists from the US and uh, Soviet Union, and they worked together, published collaboratively. There was no other place in the world that would do that. And right after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the, the Central Asian republics had no other place to go, and they came there very often. And when China was rebuilding itself after the Cultural Revolution, uh, many of the scientists from China came to the center. Of course, now they don't need the center, but at that time they did. And after the, during the Iraq war, for instance, um, people from Arabic countries, Muslim countries in general, had no place to go except the ICTP. So it played a central role uh, at different parts, of, uh, different parts of its history. And because of that, its prestige and recognition is like almost no other institution in Europe and uh, much of the rest of the world. So Salam believed that developing nations can create in this way a base of knowledge and skill required to build scientific strengths in developing countries. This task not only requires doing excellent science, but also creating a network, creating institutions um, in their own countries with the goal of supporting each other and creating credibility for science in, uh, in their own uh, countries. And Salam created not only ICTP, but also other institutions, uh, some of which um, were in Pakistan and uh, some of them in Trieste. Um, and I will only mention the, the Third World Academy of Sciences, now called the World Academy of Sciences. Um, it's a global science academy based in Trieste, working to advance science and engineering for sustainable prosperity in uh, developing countries. So the question is, how was uh, Salam able to do all this in a totally new country to him, um, this uh, beautiful Trieste that you have seen? And uh, that takes me to the third strand. How did he have this influence to create many institutions across the world? And so let me talk about his politics, his Pakistan and uh, Islam. 
So as you know, being a good scientist by itself is not enough to create institutions. You have to have the political savvy and you have to have all the right connections and things like that. First, let me say a little bit about the background, especially for those who are not from that part of the world like me. Um, there is this man who, of whom you may have heard at all. His name is Ayub Khan. He was the first military ruler of Pakistan. Until then, he, the pa Pakistani government was, um, was a democratic government. And he took office as president in 1958 and promptly promoted himself as field marshal with so many medals. But he was highly influenced by Nehru's vision for science in India. And in 1958, unveiled a science plan for Pakistan. Prince Philip, this is the husband of uh, the Queen, Queen Elizabeth. He was the guest of honor for the occasion. And already an article had appeared in Pakistan press extolling Salam as the Pakistani scientist who had made good in UK at a very young age. And he was professor in 1957, remember. So uh, Prince Philip cited Salam in his speech as an example of scientific success. This obviously put um, Salam's name on the presidential radar in the country. So he was soon appointed to Ayub Khan's scientific commission in 1959. Later, he became a member of the Pakistan's newly established Atomic Energy Commission. And uh, then that enabled him to be a delegate at the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna. And he also became the advisor to the National Education Commission, and soon he became the president's chief scientific advisor. That was part of Salam's seat of power. If you are the president's chief advisor in a country, well, that can take you many places that ordinary scientists would not be able to go, no matter how reputed. And Salam used his influence to create scientific institutions in Pakistan including the Pakistan Academy of Sciences, and he had fingers in many places in the, his own country, IAEA and UNESCO. In particular, Salam was part of the Pakistan delegation to IAEA, as I said, and he placed in front of it a resolution to create a center for theoretical physics that was his love, and the resolution was co-sponsored by many countries and opposed by some, of course, it was approved uh, with 11 abstentions from the Western world. Uh, you know, all the abstentions were from the West. And um, anyhow, the idea uh, carried uh, with the great momentum and Salam began networking with the world scientific elite like Robert Oppenheimer and Isidore Rabbi and Niels Bohr and people like that. And uh, Trieste came up with an offer that he could not refuse and the center was created thus in 1964. And Salam used to use the center to invite many excellent scientists from Pakistan as associates. And they were associates from other countries as well. And was focused on scientific development in general. Many scientists in Pakistan in particular owe intellectually to Salam and in many other countries as well. And are very happy to acknowledge themselves as his disciples. So everything was going great until 1974. And Salam was very busy commuting between Trieste, London and Oxford where his families were and uh, Islamabad very frequently and doing high level science in, in between um, with his postdocs in general, as we have already seen. Under his tutelage, many bright scientists were given government scholarships in Pakistan to study abroad. And they studied in the UK and the US and went back to Pakistan to assume important offices. And uh, Pakistan began building a great reputation in physics. And Salam appointed them associates of the center in Trieste, where they made the periodic visits, as I have already described. But the trouble started in 1972. Um, let me give a little bit of background. In 71, if you remember, um, East Pakistan became a separate country. Until now, then, it was 
East Pakistan, now it became Bangladesh. So Pakistan was very unhappy with this and it thought it was an Indian conspiracy somehow. And riding on this sentiment, Zulfikir, uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, this is the guy whom, whose picture I show here, came to power as a populist. Bhutto was an aristo aristocratic guy and a very complex person. And when in 1965, he was a member of Ayub's cabinet and he had declared, if India builds the bomb, Pakistan will eat grass or leaves, even go hungry, but we will not, we will get our own bomb. But Ayub Khan had refused to fund the thing because it was expected to be very expensive. And he said, well, we're a poor country that cannot afford it. But when he became the prime minister, one of the first things Bhutto did was to approach Libya for money. Gaddafi is supposed to have provided several hundred million dollars in huge suitcases that were brought to Pakistan, Islamabad. In fact, Bhutto courted Middle East to further Arab Islamic connections and withdrew Pakistan from the Western orbit. And on 24th of June, 1972, Bhutto organized a meeting of all his science advisors, Salam included, and asked them to prepare or get on with the task of making a bomb. So let me show you um, a video um, of, of Bhutto's press secretary who made these statements a little bit later, a few years later. If I can get it somehow. There, yeah. You know, uh, you know Bhutto could have, uh, he Bhutto had said that uh, Anything, you know, he could have got away with anything, you know. Uh, his authority was unquestioned, and loyalty to Bhutto was unquestioned, and he was looked upon as a as the great messiah. So he got all these boys together, and there were senior people, very senior people, and junior people, youngsters, and he said, "Look, you know, we're going to have a bomb. They like we're going to have a party," and he said. Uh, can you give it to me? So, you know, they started shouting like school children, you know. They said, oh, yes, 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 you can have it, you can have it, you can have it. So that uh, tells you uh, a little bit of the sentiment um, at the time. And so after that, Salam visited Pakistan again, met Bhutto, and he had, in fact, an office in uh, the secretary, secretary, secretariat of the prime minister and uh, he brought two of his uh, very uh, close colleagues to ICTP and informed them about the Pakistani government's political decision, decision to start working for the nuclear option. And Salam helped establish under Riyazuddin, whom I have shown here, whom I knew very well. He, um, uh, he created a theory division, just like the theory division in the Manhattan Project, and Riyazuddin went through all the classified Manhattan Project reports and things like that, which Salam helped to procure. And then uh, Riyazuddin was one of the, and his group were the uh, people responsible for creating the uh, part of the Pakistan bomb. There are indications that some of the Pakistan physicists sometimes collected for discussions on the general design of the bomb. That's a separate story. I got stuck with it uh, several years later, and uh, I had to um, I had to do uh, various uh, things to defend the center. But I will not uh, take you through all that. Strangely, however, um, when I explored all these things, which I would not have explored um, uh, except for the fact that I was forced to, Salam was non-committal in his reply to the press coverage at the time. Actually, the press coverage was helped with the CIA. CIA had uh, an axe to grind on this as well. But ICTP was involved in the so-called Islamic bomb. Salam simply said that the center follows a policy of ignoring whether visiting scientists are working on civilian or military projects. We have this official policy that work must be done for peaceful purposes, he said, but it's more official than kept up because it's difficult to keep up, he said. 
this was a pretty irresponsible answer to some degree. He was very indignant when asked about his role in an interview in LA Times. And there are several accounts of Salam's encouragement of the Islamic bomb. And I got hit with this, as I said, uh, with this legacy some years later. On, uh, in 74, 7th October 1974, actually, Bhutto pushed very hard for the so-called Second Amendment to its constitution, its country's constitution. And basically, the Constitution Amendment said, from now on, the Ahmadiyya sect should be regarded as non-Muslim. Ahmadiyya sect is a minority sect in, in Islam, and it believes in certain things that are abhorrent to mainstream Islam. And this is the sect to which Salam belonged. This turn of events weighed very heavily on him. Now he was essentially kicked out of his religion and unhappily he resigned from the government advisory position and he was no longer the prime minister's um, chief scientist chief scientist although he did not agree with disagree with Bhutto's position on the bomb he became uh, detached from the day-to-day -day running of the operation that he had set up on theory he became outwardly more Muslim grew a beard, as I have already shown you, added the name uh, Muhammad to his name, which uh, did not exist before. So he went for a visit to Tunisia, and somebody in Tunisia said, Professor Abdus Salam is such a small name for a great person like you. Why don't you add another name? And he added uh, his name as uh, Muhammad. And... Um, so uh, this standoff between his own personal belief in his religion and Pakistan, which essentially um, uh, had declared that he was a non-Muslim. And a little bit later, um, Bhutto was deposed by General Zia ul Haq. This is the guy, a military ruler. And he imposed the Sharia law on Pakistan and later promptly hanged Bhutto, as you may remember. He passed a new law barring Ahmadiyyas from calling their places of worship as mosques or propagating their faith as Islam. So it became really quite serious. And Saudi Arabia, for instance, which is on the you know extreme end of Islam, did not give uh, Salam a permission to set foot in the country all through his life because he wanted to perform Hajj and Umrah and uh, it was he was just not allowed to do it and which hurt him enormously. So things became so bad that when Salam got his Nobel Prize in 1979, it was decried in the country, in his country, as a Jewish conspiracy to humiliate Pakistan. And many stupid articles appeared in newspapers. And when Salam went to receive the honor in Pakistan, he somewhat uh, pompously chartered a plane and thought that uh, all the important people would come to receive him but no delegation whatsoever came. And the only guy who came was a police uh, officer. And the students threatened to stone Salam to death if the celebratory event, he was going to be given a special honor by the Pakistan government, if that event were to be held in the university. So it was held instead in the parliamentary building under the protection of the military. And uh, in that ceremony, he made a statement that he was the first Muslim Nobel laureate. And of course, it was ridiculed because he had been just declared a non-Muslim. This was not the only trouble he had. The center, as I already said, was part of UNESCO, uh, partly UNESCO. And uh, the, in the general conference of UNESCO in uh, 1973, I believe, there were three resolutions that were made against Israel. Mostly this, uh, these uh, resolutions were supported by uh, the Third World, uh, Bhutto's anti-Western views, rhetoric and actions, etc. Justly or otherwise, they were seen by many as having been shared by Salam as well, since he was still, still the chief scientific advisor to the president of Pakistan. Ignoring the calls of various colleagues from both sides of the dispute, just as, the, just as on the bomb matter, 
Salam never clarified publicly his position about where he stood vis-a-vis uh, -vis this controversy. And because of that, ICTP was also dragged into the controversy. And the, the US and Israel in particular, um, in fact, boycotted uh, the center for, a, for some two or three years. And uh, this led to great disruption in the operation of the center between 1975 and 77. And thereafter, it started uh, resuming its operation when the U UNESCO General Conference lifted the sanctions on Israel. So that was not the end of it. I will say a little bit more and then bring us back to his general idea. As the funding crisis continued, um, uh, Salam took a loan from Iran. It was uh, not a very large sum of money. It was a million and a half dollars or something like that. That was in 1980 when Iran and the West had huge problems with each other. And this loan was eventually returned, but it created considerable damage to the reputation of Salam and ICTP. All these events seem to share, seem to have changed Salam later on and especially his view of his view on uh, nuclear weapons and i uh, give you do you a, have any uh, message video. for the politicians the politicians uh, well first of all they should get rid of nuclear weapons i think that's the only message you could make for the politicians so you see a person who was really into creating uh, nuclear weapons although he himself never made any calculations or anything like that, he really finally converted to the idea that nuclear weapons were, were an, um, a total abomination. So, uh, Salam had, after he became uh, the Nobel laureate and he, um, he uh, assumed a certain importance uh, to himself and to the rest of the world, he thought using his influence, he could raise about $2 billion to support science in Islamic countries. Because he was really caught up by the past glory of Islamic state when the Christian world was still in dark ages. And he thought that the worthiness of the idea and his unique clout as the first Muslim Nobel laureate would open up the purses of many rich Arab countries, but nothing came of it except for Kuwait, which gave about quarter million dollars, every other Islamic country just turned him down. And this was a huge uh, disappointment for Salam. As a final topic, even though Salam continued close connections with many of his fellow scientists in Pakistan, even though he had resigned from his government position, uh, he lost his base of power in Pakistan. So his mind turned to other possibilities. In 1987, he aspired to be the Director General of UNESCO, but his country basically um, did not support him and uh, it thwarted all his ambitions. And that too is a longer story, which we will not uh, discuss. Soon after he fell sick and many of his colleagues thought it was a great disappointment that led to his sickness, but it was diagnosed with, he was diagnosed with uh, progressive supranuclear palsy, PSP, and he, um, his speech deteriorated and he was incomprehensible, but he continued to travel once in a while, but it created huge difficulties for himself and for his uh, host. After Salam died in Oxford in 1996, November 21st, his body was flown to Pakistan on November 25th, where he wanted to be buried, buried in the same graveyard as his parents. There was no guarantee that this process would go through without any altercations because his Ahmadiyya sect was still ostracized. No officials came, but a number of visitors and friends did. And his tombstone proud, proudly described, I'm showing it here, Professor Muhammad Abdus Salam, son of such and such, etc., etc. If you go to um, a line with a little blank there, it actually said, Abdus Salam, the first Muslim Nobel laureate. Um, but then, because he was uh, excommunicated officially, one of the 
a local um, local magistrates ordered that the word Muslim be obliterated from this uh, from this um, uh, tombstone. As you can see, that's the word that is removed. And it now reads ridiculously as Abdul Salam, the first um, blank uh, Nobel laureate, which does not make any sense whatsoever. So in death as in his life, Salam was vilified in the country to which he had tried so much to contribute uh, in science and in other ways. So I want to conclude a little bit on uh, this whole thing. Um, so there have been um, uh, great physicists in the 20th century, and some of them were no doubt deeper than Salam, uh, Dirac, Feynman, Fermi, etc. But there have been very few people with the same grand view of physics and a deep commitment for the science, scientific progress of humanity as a whole especially in the underdeveloped parts. The center that he created support many excellent scientists whose careers might not have prospered as much otherwise. In Pakistan in particular, he did many wonderful things by being able to creatively bend others to his will to get things done. He started and led many development and science centers there. Yet, as we have seen, he underwent severe hardships towards the end. So one should ask, why did his past skills that enabled him to do so many good things not come to his rescue? What lessons do we have for us broadly? Obviously, I give my own version of the possible answers, which may or may not be right. But as Salam focused on science, everybody adored his efforts. CTP was created, um, international science was accepted at the time, Clear recognition that nurturing talent in developing countries was a worthy cause. I don't think a center like that can be created now at all. And Salam, with his scientific eminence, was a natural spokesperson. Then began the perception that Salam was using his eminence and clout, including ICTP's resources, for pursuing another agenda. And the, whether he was really very strongly involved or not, the Pakistan bomb effort was one in to which he was tied, and he did not deny that at uh, any given any time in his life, and it created many negative connotations. Finally, when Salam egotistically assumed the mantle of pulling the entire Muslim world out of its mild state in science, he doomed him because he ran into a wall of excommunication, which was part of a bigger political ploy that uh, he could really not control. He was thus reduced to the task of arguing for something against which he was explicitly sanctioned. This was a huge overstretch, even for someone like a genius like Salam. Many great people in human history have overstretched themselves. You, you only have to look at some really distinguished people, and they usually paid various sorts of prices for it. In Salam's case, the real problem was that he was proclaiming, proclaiming himself to be a Muslim, whereas the establishment had decreed that he wasn't one. And furthermore, whenever the tussles arose between, uh, between uh, developing countries and developed countries, as in UN, percolating down to ICTP and to Salam, he invariably hedged his bets. He, had, he was, after all, a professor in Imperial College, but he was also the advisor to the prime minister in Pakistan. So these are extremely conflicting kind of things. And the ambiguity of his words and actions led to the breakdown of the trust people had in him. So it's the same stance he took when confronted with accusations about Pakistan bomb making. So great physicist, great physicist that he was, recognized by everyone as a man with enormous compassion for fellow humans, he was less than straightforward in his behavior. That failing matters far less in smaller people, smaller people with smaller agenda and smaller stretch of um, I, uh, ideas than Salam. But in a person like himself who, who was propelled into such prominence, that did not seem to make that much sense. So, um, so this is Salam school, which. I will skip, but I want to end by uh, uh, displaying for you this uh, little video, which shows his passion for science and 
he obviously believed in it uh, entirely all his life and here he is speaking for himself you cannot escape knowledge science is knowledge so this is my summary of salam's life and as i said there are lessons for each one of us to learn um for some it may be too late but it does not matter um i thank you again for your attention and for the honor you have done to me to bring to this platform thank you very much uh professor srinivasan uh, on behalf of the president of purdue who welcomed you uh, Pre president uh, mitch daniels and our uh, executive vice president for uh, research and partnership study samair and indeed the entire purdue community it is my distinct honor to present this special globe uh, to you and uh, i would like to especially thank you for uh, giving us this uh, talk uh, on the discovery park distinguished uh, lecture the first one on the web we would certainly love to invite you back to the campus and uh, learn about us in physics and mechanical engineering and uh, certainly produce contributions to the higgs boson discovery as well as contribution to laser physics by nobel laureate c v raman's last phd student a k ramdas are legendary uh, with that uh, uh, i want to thank everyone who made this e special event possible and nicole uh, would be uh, taking over the charge of uh, uh, sending you this beautiful globe uh, and uh, they were uh, able to get uh, the nameplate made for this globe so we are delighted to have uh, listened to a great uh, discovery park distinguished lecture thank you so very much thank you so much i'll uh, come again yeah thank you okay sir so i'll uh, sign off now nicole uh, with that we send it back to you that's it thank you everyone for attending yeah, okay thank, thank you nicole Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Thank you Hasti. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. Everyone. Please send us feedback. Yeah, right. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you.